Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us in this uh, fantastic uh, episode around what's happening around uh, what's on everybody's minds right now is primarily what's going on with uh, India and China. And uh, there are many experts who talk about this, uh, who tell what's going on and tell why it's happened and all that. So today um, I want to uh, look at this from different lens as to how did we get here? That's as the first segment of our talk is going to be around how did you even get here? What is the history of these two nations that brought us to this situation? And the second one is around what's happening right now. So it's a we will actually talk, but, uh, you know, we will have perspectives of uh, folks who have lived their life and who have been there um, in, the, in the recent past. And the third is what does it mean for us? You know, what does it mean in terms of if we were to take a peek into the future? How could we uh, take advantage of it or what what uh, this would, you know, what kind of situation this would put us in? These are the three uh, segments that we will talk about today. And uh, for this discussion, I have two gentlemen, uh, one from Army and one from Navy. And uh, one is uh, Commander Jagannath. He was in, in the Navy and um, Colonel Dini, he was in army. Um, instead of me botching up their introductions, I will actually ask them to, um, you know, give their uh, talk about their background and, and their experience. And I think um, it will be fantastic to hear from them. So welcome to the panel, um, Colonel Dini and Commander Jagannath. And why don't we get started with Colonel Dini? Can you please talk to me about your experience? Where have you been? And uh, one thing I'm very excited about is that you have been in Galwan. So uh, I don't know if I'm watching that up as well. So please do give us a little bit of your background. Thank you. Thank you, Bala. And very nice to uh, connect with uh, Jagan sir once again. And uh, uh, as far as I go, I'm an, uh, I was an infantry officer with the Indian Army for about 22 years. And uh, I've served in all kinds of terrain and uh, operational uh, challenges. Uh, that includes multiple tenures in the in Kashmir Valley, and of course, I commanded my battalion in uh, in the line of actual control, uh, which is the Pengongso battalion rather, not the Galwan battalion, but the Pengongso uh, area. Uh, in between, also, I had a, a tenure with uh, the United Nations as a military observer, and finally, I was posted as a faculty in uh, Defence Services Staff College as well. So that's it, and I keep writing, uh, contribute some of my what of my thoughts keep coming about this. So that's about me. Jagan okay. sir, over to you. Like, Thank uh, you. I was in the Navy for uh, 22 years. Again, um, I've uh, had extensive operational experience. I've even visited China um, in uh, 2019 on their uh, anniversary. Like, you know, that was their uh, big anniversary time. So they had a fleet review. So I was on board the uh, I was on board a destroyer, mighty destroyer, which had visited that. So I've interacted with them firsthand. Uh, my operational experience at sea has been extensive. I'm a gunnery and missile uh, technology specialist. I've commanded a fast attack craft. And um, last but not the least, I was an instructor at Defense Services Staff College, where me and uh, Dini were uh, colleagues and we worked closely together, wargaming various scenarios uh, with respect to China. So we have our thoughts set, like, you know, how, how it pans out and what are the situations and what are our possible responses. This this occupies quite a lot of time in our academic and uh, tactical and strategic mil military institutions. So we've been a part of that too. Uh, over to you, Bala. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Thank you. And I, I mean, I could have gotten better people uh, for this conversation, but a whole lot uh, has been uh, has have been happening in the past uh, month. And but I'm more intrigued by um, you know a couple of things as a layman, right? I mean, as a layman who probably has heard um, histories in bits and pieces. So it's hard to kind of construct a mental narrative for me as to what led us, what led to this particular situation between us and China. A uh, few thoughts come to my mind, but I, I think uh, you guys would be able to add a lot more nuance to that. Is that A, is that, you know, Chinese civilization and our civilization are the one of the oldest uh, still running civilizations, right? So I think, we, and we have some history of the past interactions between India and China. There has been trade routes, there have been some ambassadors, there have been books written, um, you know, between uh, these two civilizations. There has been some relationship going on there. So what has that relationship uh, been like? And then uh, during the colonial period, how did that relationship change? And uh, 
um, and, and, and then, you know, we had a war. That's, that's something everybody knows in 1962. You know, what kind of led to that war? And it kind of seemed like after some time, it's uh, we see each other in the, in the international sphere, but we don't see each other in the Asian sphere, which is kind of bizarre to me. We see more of Pakistan and more of Europe and more of US, but we actually don't see too much of China in the in the age as an Asian counterpart, we only kind of you know hear about China only when something blows up big time. Why? Why is that? Why is that? Um, uh, you know, they, they, there's a difference between the relationship between the or the, how we see the West versus how we see China. I would imagine, given that you know uh, culturally we probably seem to be similar, we should have had much more um, cordial and. Uh, closer relationship with China from both mindset, culture, and economic trade perspective. What do you guys think about it as to what has led to this in terms of historically, what has been some of the, uh, you know, some of the inflection points where we were together or where we diverged? Let's, uh, let, let's kick it off with Jagan. Jagan, what do you think about it? Uh, yeah, Bala. So, uh, I mean, you have, you have, I mean, the questions you asked, like, you know, span about, you know, a couple of, I mean, more than a few centuries. So uh, my primarily, years, maybe it's millennia. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> yeah, it's a millennia. Right. So primarily the the key factor which contributed to India-China relation uh, is geographic in nature. Uh, the geography was not very conducive for us to interact as neighbors. And there was this great Himalayan barrier which acted as a bulwark against, you know, contact between these two nations. So if you go take a look at the map, you know, you will realize that uh, and, and our own history that most of most of our incursions or most of the invasions which happened in, in our country are all originating from the West. Right. We didn't have anything coming in from the East. Uh, the only only connection or only uh, military point of view incursion is the Chola punitive raids in the Southeast Asia. But that was again the Southeast Asia. So. To reach China right now, if you have to go, if you cannot cross the Himalayan barrier, you need to sail all around Southeast Asian countries and go on to the South China Sea, cross the South China Sea and reach China. And that's that's pretty, uh, pretty much of a big barrier between India and China. Right. Uh, so this barrier got broken down in uh, in like, you know, by, by modern technology, like, you know, flights happened and you could just fly over Himalayas uh, uh, suddenly. So that started the interaction. I mean, that increased the interaction between both the nations. But uh, fundamentally, again, I will hand over to uh, Colonel Dini now, uh, is fundamentally there is the barrier which is still in place. And that's the point wherein we both are meeting and we both are doing that. Uh, you have to realize the Chinese geography is, is hugely oriented towards their eastern side. 90% of the population, there is something called 15 ISO headline, uh, which demarcates the rainfall area, and 90% of the population lies east of it. There's very, very few, uh, I mean, uh, the density of population drastically drops as you come uh, towards the western side of uh, China. Over to you, Colonel Dini, your opinions on this, please. Absolutely. I mean, I completely agree with uh, Jagan, sir, that uh, the ge geography has played a major role uh, with res respect to the history of uh, both the countries. There's no doubt in that. Apart from that, there are two um, other issues which we need to focus on is basically what is the fundamental belief or what is the kind of, you know, civilizational uh, baggage, if you can put it in that way, what, uh, out of which the current uh, state of the nation is is today. Let's, let's firstly analyze the Chinese. You know, the Chinese always uh, believed in this middle kingdom concept, which is quite uh, well known now in which uh, they felt that the emperor was, you know, uh, was nominated by the heaven and he was he was supposed to rule and he, his kingdom was in the and that is because these people did not realize that there were all, there were other people uh, across like the Himalayas being a barrier sea to the eastern side. So that venturing out was limited and they felt that they were in the middle of the earth and they had this inner subjects, the outer subjects. Then they had those uh, states which were known as the tributary states. And after the tributary states were known as the barbarians. So that was their outlook uh, towards uh, the world as such. So that somehow, uh, you know, kind of a superiority complex uh, mindset, I think, was laid in, the, in them in a very, from a very, very long time. So that is how, you know, uh, uh, because uh, they did not explore towards much from the, towards the Himalayan side, towards the Indian side. And, you know, they considered 
in, in all probability towards whatever was the Indian side as barbarians and they were supposed to be defeated and they were supposed to be treated in that way. The, each, this inner subjects, the outer subjects, the, uh, the tributaries, all these were supposed to be treated differently as per their concept. So this is one of the Chinese. Concept. Now let's see, analyze the Indian concept. The Indian concept, uh, you know, more or less uh, was outlined uh, by the Kautalian, uh, you know, uh, Arthashastra, uh, somewhere around three, third BC. And here, what the Kautalian uh, thing was, what he said was something known as the Vijigishu. Vijigishu is is, some, uh, is known as the uh, potential conqueror. So they, he being in the center, and then the, uh, uh, in that the kingdom being in the center, and the border was, uh, you know, uh, covered by someone known as Ari. Ari means enemy. So uh, the Vijigishu is in the center and you had Ari surrounding it and surrounding the Ari was Mitra. So these kind of circles were there. So you had first the Vijigishu, then you had the Ari, which is the enemy, and then you had the Mitra, and then you had Ari, Ari Mitra, then again Mitra and Ari Mitra Mitra. So this was kind of concentric circles, which was the basic concept of the Kautilian uh, thought. And that I think... Uh, for a very long time, if you see, analyze whether it is a small kingdom or a big kingdom, it, it does make sense that within the immediate periphery, you always had conflicts. I think even that is relevant even today. And beyond that, you know, uh, you, you will find your friend circle there. So if that also was, I think, a, a hindrance or maybe the mindset was uh, coupled with geography. Why we didn't have that much of, uh, you know, close connectivity. Uh, or interaction with China. Of course, uh, you know, as, as I said, there were there were interactions. Buddhism went from India. There were, those kind of things did happen. There was trade tra trade routes then also. But the kind of civilizations and the kind the large countries which uh, the, or the you know the civilizations which were there, keeping that in mind, the amount of interaction, the amount of uh, influence, if I can put, uh, and cooperation and all was limited. And even uh, you know I know uh, like being from Kerala. There were people who had traded, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, they came by uh, ship and um, they, they established ambassadors in Kerala as, you know, late as uh, so many years before. So those kind of things did happen, but it did not. The kind of India today, we see the influence from, you know, the, the Western uh, border or the Western kind of thing, that kind of thing did not happen. So I think a, a combination of geography plus the basic belief system which we had uh, was one of the reasons, uh, Bala, because of which this kind of thing is there. Now, other question that I always intrigued and uh, uh, is is around the fact that uh, China seemed to have much more homogeneous society uh, today. Obviously, it's a you know they speak one language. Obviously, something changed. Uh, whereas India still speaks like you know our you know the official languages are around you know in in two dozen or so, and we speak hundreds of languages. Even ethnic, ethnically, uh, from an ethnicity perspective, there's tremendous amount of diversity, cultural diversity, tremendous amount of diversity here. Uh, China seems a lot more monolithic. How did that happen? When did that happen? By the way, is it is it more recent during the you know the communist uh, regime side, or was it also pre before that? Uh, here comes an interesting question and uh, interesting point, which which also coincides, uh, you know, largely. Uh, the, the monolithic structure was established well before. I mean, unification of China happened over three millennia. But the modern China, which we see right now, is is the creation and uh, and a a precursor to that was what China's it and it forms a very strong part of internal Chinese psyches. What they call it as a century of humiliation. So you can you can trace back China from where the monarchy existed uh, till about say 1839 when the first opium war started and then that century of humiliation happened with Japanese occupation, Second World War, and it ended in 1949. And that's where, like, you know, this this modern my Chinese mindset, we can trace its uh, roots to. I will I will uh, request Colonel Dini, like, you know, his, he's been there. So his opinions on what happened between this, like, you know, from the time this 1839 to 1949 and and where we landed up at the dawn of independence is what I would love to hear is, uh, you know, uh, thoughts. That's very interesting. Kalna Dini, what's your view yeah, on what? So there was a series of conflicts at that point of time, whether it was the first um, Anglo war, uh, the opium war, the second opium war, the Japanese made multiple times they came in. So uh, each time the Chinese were on the receiving end. 
so there was no doubt that you know whether it was the um, uh, anglo french combination whether it was japanese each time and you know it's a it's a lesson in itself but suffice to say that each time the the each time the chinese were seen as being humiliated they were made to do uh, agreements which were against them so this happened over a period of you know time till uh, you know, till the 1945 rather uh, you know when the war finally finished and after that uh, there was a clash between uh, and that is the time you know 1921 when uh, when the communists uh, first established uh, themselves in in china under mao and uh, also that was a period when the nationalist party uh, of china also was in was in play there so there was and there was a this fight uh, in the world war as it is it moved into world war now after the world war we all know what happened japanese were defeated but still the the nationalist party were under they were under the it was still a republic but somehow down the line you know the chinese uh, the communist uh, they were fighting together by the way they were fighting together for a period of time against the japanese but after the 1945 when the war was over the the true colors of communism came into fore and the, the nationalist uh, the so called nationalists they were pushed Uh, uh, back and uh, and 1949 comprehensively they came to power i mean there is a lot of history behind that so in 1949 a truly a communist nation was born under mao now when he uh, when he inherited uh, just like india what we did uh, what we inherited in 1947 was of course a, a nation with lot of poverty with lot of challenges uh you know the the world war had its scar uh, so many years of colonial uh, ruling had its 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 problems so both nations were actually on on a, on a similar kind of thing you know such rich civilization but yet so poor was the state in 1947 and 49 and from there on uh, you know we took a path of course was a democratic path under pandit nehru and which i strongly feel was the best path for our nation and we pursued that despite the kind of problems which from day 1 which we uh, from we have seen the, despite the problems still we insisted on that part and we went along with that part 1949 onwards mao was brutally implementing the the kind of uh, communist totalitarian regime uh, with with a iron hand and uh, it is almost till his lifetime that is he died in 1976 this this era a pure communist era where in there was total party control there was absolutely uh, you know uh, this the party was the 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 most powerful thing happened and india in the meantime also evolved itself you know moving from uh, from trying to bring out pof, uh, uh, people from poverty as much as possible and till about 76 77 and uh, 78 80s rather uh, we both uh, were at par okay and uh, uh, now uh, i'll just broadly tell you and from there we'll again come back to our narrative of what happened there so in 1978 it is interesting to know uh, of course uh, uh, then uh, uh, deng xiaoping came into power in 1978 and in 1978 the chinese uh, gdp was comparable with zambia you know mm-hmm. that was the kind of uh, thing which they had and from there on Uh, there was a change which happened as we f- famously he said that no matter uh, you know uh, whether the cat is a black or a white as long as it catches the mice it's a good cat so what he was trying to say was that you know uh, uh, socialism uh, can include certain elements of capitalism as well he said making money is not bad was the kind of thing which he started propagating and uh, uh, he said that you know you don't have to be uh, you know the 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 famous sayings that time was you have to become rich before getting old so those kind of things started coming in and that's how the entire um, uh, thing opened up he started concentrating on industry agriculture uh, science and technology and defense these four was his key uh, area where he focused a lot and that is when you will see that pla also making lot of changes because till then pla also was not it was actually a peace and army kind of a thing it was you know much more um i mean it was not a a great um, uh, professional army like what today what it it can it claims to be so those kind of things also started changing from deng xiaoping's time and that is a time uh, you know uh, after which uh, i think china has not looked back uh, ever since there and india in the meanwhile it took another 5, 12 to 13 years from 78 to 1991 when finally we opened up the market and you know we also the the potential which we had uh, uh, was known to the world so there was a time lag there then 
secondly the you know there is a difference between uh, you know getting a thing organized in a communist state where you, your order is you know implemented and a democratic country like us where each one of us has an opinion on everything and you know we are free to open so somewhere the down the line when we are going uh, towards in a different trajectory you know we should be very careful in assessing analyzing uh, or even comparing uh, these two growth rates because these two growth rates uh, the statistics yes it is there but those statistics do not tell the complete story there is there is a lot of history of of uh, of um, uh, how would i put it uh, of history of <clears throat> sufferings also in china the, to the state which there we all know about the famine and we know about the you know long ma a lot of issues are there you know kind of thing which 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 has resulted now this was the state in today what we've come to wherein uh, we both countries are now again in the same state like in 1947 49 where both are aspiring to be you know emerging uh, one is already feels that he's there but and india is emerging towards that so again i think a, a circle has come almost coming to full circle now wherein we started off uh, you know somewhere uh, as close as you know the same relation was i mean i was comparable and then we took a different path and then china is far far ahead now it's almost four to five times us but still you know india still is not that you know it can be just discounted and uh, it cannot be you know uh, that okay fine they, they are on just no comp no we are also reaching there and today i think more and more country believes that we have a potential uh, into getting into that uh, into that zone where so i think again we are coming back to the same place where we started off in for maybe in another 10 20 years maybe we'll get back there very yeah. interesting narrative here uh, kalnal deni i like to probably rephrase it into saying there were two circles because we both had civilizationally started at a very strong point both were equally like you know 25% of gdp at once upon a time but obviously both suffered um quite a lot during the colonial period like the 100 years of humiliation that you talked about and 200 plus years of humiliation that india went through and again we went from like 25% to like 3% or 2% right uh, by by 1949 we again found ourselves at the same starting point at that point um but we had very different paths and now we we are seeing each other mainly because of the point that you said both feel like we have arrived and both feel like it is our it is our time to you know kind of play a bigger role um growth rates uh, differences aside there is an aspiration there is a belief that is kind of bringing us back into the same um you know point a uh, very interesting narrative uh, jagan uh, you had uh, some point yes i wanted to ask colonel dini after having been at in in at the place actually physically commanding a uh, battalion in the place uh, what can he tell us at the at at when 1949 when china became like you know prc took over and 1947 indian government took over what was the border like they like you know they, 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 there was nothing right like you know it's a new government coming there it's not a prc just it's it's a newborn baby right it Absolutely. came up and it inherited something we inherited something from the britishers right so what was the border like and what is the border between india and china look like with all this confusion which is going around if you can throw some light and clarify that will be great for us yeah we are seeing like the people republic of china right that what we call as china today yeah. yes all right go ahead so go ahead. uh, uh, uh jagan sir that's a good question and you know many of us do not understand this that uh, Uh, there is a there is a problem uh, there is a dispute a border dispute which is there uh, uh, between india and china which, and this has been since 1947 since the day we got independence now uh, after we got independence the britishers left britishers had you know certain uh, drawn certain lines uh, which you know macmahon line johnson line mccartney line so there are very lot of uh, lines at various point of time Uh, uh along for de- demarcating uh, uh, the border between india and uh, Ch- china and at, at, at actually uh, with in many cases the, uh, the erstwhile tibet so that was the fact uh, which was there now after the britishers left uh, uh, the many of the area there was you know broad consensus but it will be surprised to for uh, you know for many to know that in 1947 when we drew a map the map of india we had left the current aksai chin area as blank you know if you go and just see the map of 1947 the there is no boundary demarcating showing the area of aksai chin so that was left blank in 1947 can anybody visualize that today a country uh, is born and you don't have a boundary in that particular area 
precisely because uh, pandit nehru and the government of the day felt that you know where do we draw and there was a time uh, you know uh, because uh, we had uh, good relations with china you know uh, those kind of things were there so start point was there that you did not draw a boundary in 1947 you did not draw a boundary in 1950 in 1950 the same map the official map was written as undefined boundary there was only shade was given there was no uh, you know there was no clear demarcation shown as uh, uh, as a as a as a, ma- a marking it was written, it was written as undefined boundary you didn't we did not you know make it in 1950 so from 50 to 55 was the era of cooperation between india and china you know those punch shield and all those things happened yeah hindi chini bye bye yeah, yeah, and all those things were there and yes yeah. i mean they were all in with good intentions there is nothing i mean uh, but yet we we in uh, you know imagine a country born uh, the first thing actually, uh, you know even when we make a house is we make a fence first you know we want to you know that's the first thing which we do but here is a country born and you do not have a boundary 3 years after that you still do not have a boundary and once the chinese started uh, you know uh, started making claims there you know there is an interesting story uh, i am i don't know how much it is true but i have read it that uh, uh, the ambassador in china uh, i think it was mr km panikar he came to know that the chinese are building a road uh, in aksai chin uh, through the newspaper so he happened to know that you know that is being inaugurated or something and then he came to know that you know there's a road which is and then when he saw that he you know he felt that this is in our area so that is how the message was sent back and then the patrols were sent ahead to check it out what happened and then that's how the initial patrols were started probing and they yes they found that there was a road and that is from that, that is from the period from 55 to 60 this conflict started this road uh, was built in the in in 59 if i'm not wrong and that is the time in uh, on 20th of october uh, 1959 the first conflict happened in konkhala which is the erstwhile place now where the the current conflict of hot springs is there it is in aksai chin area and there uh, india uh, lost uh, about 10 sol- uh, soldiers they were actually policemen the erstwhile the uh, crpf people they were the, those were the p- people the policemen used to go for patrolling that time they went and they were ambushed by the chinese and that was the first uh, physical casualties by the indians of was on 1959 and then you know what happened in 1962 so after 1959 then there was pressure on the government uh you know to you know and then before that b- between 55 and uh, uh, you know this is the time when we started claiming the entire uh, uh aksai chin mm. you know there there were we had three options uh, when in 1947 either you claim the the present one which is the the maximalist kind of thing that is the johnson line which we say so which is the current ib then second was the mccartney line uh, which was there which is which is somewhere along the you know the current claim uh, the the claim line which or not claim line actually towards towards the current claim line of uh, china and also uh, you know we can we could have gone around the karakoram range line so these were the three options but then finally india you know after debating whether they wanted to go this wanted to go for maximum or and they finally decided on going for the maximum johnson that the entire aksai chin as part of india so that was the background to it now in 62 the war happened we know what happened uh, and uh, uh, there after the 62 war the chinese came up to their claim line and beyond a little bit of beyond uh, what uh, their initial claim that is the 1959 claim what they said is their area after the 62 war they captured areas up to 59 claim and beyond so after the 62 war they moved back bit but they do not move back in all areas uh, beyond even their claim line they were there at their claim line in some areas they are ahead of their claim lines however in the in arunachal they moved back uh, uh, to, uh, well uh, behind the uh, the de facto border which is the macmahon line uh, yeah so they went to the uh, pre existing position absolutely the pre existing area so but in in ladakh or aksai chin area they did not so this uh-huh. is the background uh, to which we ha- we are the current existing and that's how this concept of line of actual control came in that yeah. was in 1962 Can, can you it, just explain explain like you know what is line of actual control yeah. how is it different between loc the movie loc people have heard yeah. about it but yeah. lac is a new thing what is yeah. loc what is lac what is like you know what are these yeah. terms mean yeah. for you who so, was actually on the ground yeah so the line of actual control was uh, the notional line between indian forces and chinese forces after the 1962 war 
after the 1962 war it was agreed that both sides would move back 20 kilometers each and the line which was separating this 20 kilometers each became the de facto line of actual control so basically Uh, the the line of actual control means the area till which we can control your whether your you can go for patrolling and all so that was the kind of thing and that is that has become the line of actual control which is which is not uh, demarcated on ground it is not being it is there is nothing on map there is no agreement and there has been no exchange of maps also between india and china to say okay chinese know what is indian perception of the line of actual control or the indians know what is the chinese perception of the line of control wow. it is not there so just imagine now you know without any maps without any physical demarcation on ground without even knowing each other what what do the other people claim we are there guarding each other's border and that is why this conflict so now just to finish off this when you are patrolling you never know whether you have even crossed that line yeah. because there's no line that's what absolutely. you're saying right absolutely okay. and just a quick word on line of uh, line of control now line of control is the uh, line which was uh, you know there between india and pakistan after the 1971 war so after the okay. 1971 war we had you know and in fact the, uh, uh, before that also there was a you know ceasefire line which was of 1947 48 uh, the, after the war of uh, after the Kash- first kashmir war which took place so there was a ceasefire line which was there so after the 71 war this was you know more or less uh, signed and maps were exchanged to know that which is the uh, line of control between uh, the, both the forces both the countries so india knows what is the line of control pakistan knows what is the line of control so uh, th- there are uh, posts which are looking okay. uh, opposite each other so they know that this is so you know uh, although over a period of time even that you know if it is in, in line of control it is grabbers are keepers you know if you uh, if you just yeah. uh, the map may be yeah. there but if in case you shut your eyes somebody will come and sit there so those kind of things keep happening there but that's then there is understanding kargil yeah that's they, what that happened that is what that was what they tried in kargil but Kargil's. they did not succeed okay. yeah. so uh, 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 so this is the difference fundamental difference that you know there is a line of control a line of actual control is a notional thing and two armies are just uh, guarding it based on the perceptions of each other so how do how does it pan out for you who commanded a battalion how was your like you know day like like you know uh, i mean like like we hear about galwan happening what is in the mindset of a battalion commander in such an area like you know when 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 things are not there and you still are expected to defend it and mm-hmm. you still are not expected i mean uh, not allowed to escalate allow things to escalate yeah. to any extent and still ensure the safety of your troops and men under your and it's a, and all this is an extremely inhospitable terrain Right? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So we'll love no to doubt. hear your hear your uh, experiences there. Absolutely. So first of all, this uh, it is a cold desert. That's what uh, the Eastern Ladakh. Uh, you know, uh, there's a famous saying in Ladakh that only the best of friends and the worst of enemies come back uh, visiting us. That's what uh, they say. And because of yeah. because it is it is <laughs> the, the climate is so so ex- for a you know for a person from who is from the mean sea level, and you know you straight away go up to fourteen thousand, fifteen thousand, sixteen thousand feet. you know it takes a toll on your body you know your body does get affected and uh, of course there is a process of uh, acclimatization uh, your body there is a scientific process procedure in which you know you go through a, 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 the routine of 7 days of acclimatization then 14 days at, at various stages but still still there is a lot of your efficiency come down by almost 40 to 50% the oxygen level is just about 60% the temperatures in the winters go down to minus 30 35 degrees celsius uh, wind chill factor you know you, uh, you chill blains blockages artery getting blocked because of low oxygen a lot of issues are there now given in this scenario uh, you are expected to uh, you know uh, ensure the sanctity of the line of actual control uh, by because you have a map which is marked you know exactly where is your Uh, your your line of action so you will go up to patrolling up till there now that's a different issue that chinese don't know that but uh, over a period of time you know general understanding is that okay because there's a pattern of patrolling which we both sides follow so we have a broad understanding okay this is i think where he is claiming and this is i think uh, you know they also know because we both come to the same point every time so they know okay this is the area t- till which they claim and they also come to that area now problem comes when there is a uh, overlap of that such areas and such areas are known as the areas of differing perceptions along the line of actual control so you must understand that there is first a line of actual control which is notional and within that you have now areas of differing perceptions where there is My overlap God. yeah so now you see how much of conflict can happen now the classical case of pengong so i'll just explain it in a minute 
that uh, you know there are a series of finger like structures which are coming out from the mountains and coming in and uh, you know jutting out and coming and joining the yeah. pang also from the northern bank now there are about eight fingers which are which is it is named fingers because it resembles a finger human finger so from it starts from uh, west to east from finger 1 to finger 8 now uh, uh, we have our uh, our area till finger 4 that is our we control we have our area till finger 4 and chinese are beyond further to the east of finger 8 but we claim that is our line of actual control we claim is till finger 8 but the chinese say no it is not finger 8 it is further to the west it is finger 4 so they come for patrolling from crossing finger 8 up till finger 4 and we go for patrolling crossing finger 4 till finger 8 so there's a gap of 8 kilometers here where there is an overlap so what happens when you when your troops are uh, when you patrol they patrol and you come face to face what what happens then this is exactly what is happening right now sometimes you get into fist fight sometime you get into I pushing got. mode but generally most of the time uh, you know uh, we do have an agreement that what should be the modus operandi when Uh, such thing like what jagan sir was trying to okay. when you come in close contact what are the thing that is why these all these agreements border agreements and all come into play so you have agreements right from 93 onwards there are many uh, border agreements which which are there uh, which which ends, which ensures that uh, you know uh, uh, there are no conflicts which do not go out of hand out of so hand. there is a there is a, a mechanism which is known as the banner drill both sides carry banners with each other Uh, and they you know show that uh, uh, that they are not enemies they try to there is a particular way to carry a weapon so there is an established mechanism in which when the troops come together in close vicinity they come there and they uh, they uh, they have supposed to break they are supposed to go off uh, uh, you know uh, immediately they are not supposed to hang around but the problem comes when when uh, you know this frequency increases then there is you know human angle coming into play uh, so if If emotions once emotions come yeah. in absolutely sir. yeah so then you start calling more people into the you are always actually 10 people 10 is the uh, the strength of the patrol but uh, after some time what happens is because of your uh, you know the kind of uh, thing which is there you start calling more people so there are suddenly 100 people on both sides now uh, in this 100 people you never know how anybody will behave and then you get into yeah. a fist fight and then you know we saw that those, those ugly scenes in which both there was massive violence yes. from, and there were casualties on both sides and then the third stage is what we see currently wherein they just come and place their tents uh, there and sit there showing that you know we are not happy with whatever you know those kind of things so okay. but there is a parallel mechanism that there is a uh, a border personal meeting hut where both sides come together they uh, talk it out with each other and then we return back to the status quo and that is what is famously now referred to as status quo ante that means you go back to the time when uh, the way it was like you come to ma- the area where you feel is your area we will come to our area but nobody will stop each other no construction will be allowed in this so let us just remain that way two yeah. uh, two questions um yeah uh, you, you know you alluded to it and we also keep seeing it in the uh, in the in the in the tv that you know there is fist fight i mean you don't you're not allowed to use weapons and uh, what is why is that like in on the other side in line of control loc we do use weapons whereas here we don't use weapon uh what wh- why is what is the reason for that see there is um, uh, it is as uh, because both are different like, like how, how you know the situation is different the adversary uh, is uh, uh, adversary is also strong term but the you know the, the opposite people those are there though, though they are different the operational dynamics is different now when i say different what do i mean by different you know with pakistan we have fought how many wars four wars and there is a constant uh, and actually we are fighting a war every day in kashmir that's because of you know pakistan pushing in terrorist every day as we speak at this moment there was there must be something happening along the line of control wherein they're pushing in terrorist then there is uh, in, that is in kashmir then there has been issue in mumbai there has been parliament attack all this goes back to the base at pakistan so we know that this is a war which is constant now if you see china we had a war in 1962 there is no doubt that you know that also there are two narratives you know whether india the india's china war or china's india war you want to read which one that you know is or but then yes there was a war there is a mistrust which is there you know and china has not done anything 
uh, uh, you know, in favor of India, uh, before which we can be, you know, absolutely uh, feel good about it. You know, they've been constantly against us joining as a permanent member of the UN Security Council. Uh, you know, the, the uh, then you, you you saw the nuclear support group issue. We saw how they support, yeah, they support Pakistan and on various issues. We know that. So whether it's trade related issues, the trade imbalance which is there. So it is not that uh, you know China is kind kind of a, but then still. You cannot compare the Chinese activities with what Pakistan is constantly on an everyday basis they're doing. So these are for a fundamental two differences which are there. Okay. That is number one. Number two is that after 1962, this was the first time when, uh, of course, in 67, we had a, this one, uh, a skirmish. And 75 was the last time, 1975 was the last time when we lost a combat soldier in such things. So you see almost 43 years, there was not a single shot fired. There was no casualties because of this. That, that itself shows that across uh, the both sides uh, political leadership respective of which party they wanted that let's have a modus vivendi sort of thing in which uh, even despite the disputes we can cooperate with uh, with china so that kind of thing was so that percolated down to the troops on ground and there was as i mentioned earlier there were agreements so that this peace and tranquility could be there and which i think it survived for 43 44 years which is good which is which is good. So that is why the fundamental difference. You know, here you're fighting a daily war, and the last war which we fought with China was in 1962. So that is the difference. So uh, and also uh, both sides, as far as India and China knows, they are not uh, looking for a war. But, but I don't, I can't say with the same co confidence with Pakistan. With mm -hmm. China, it is quite. See, they are not looking. For China, even Chinese, they don't. You know, I don't think at this stage they are looking for a war with India or you know, for, because they have their own priorities. They want their economy to grow. They want to become a champion state by, let's say, 2049. So they are looking at, you know, different. Uh, but if you just compare that with Pakistan, what are their priorities? You will you will get the answers, you know, where it is. So that is the fundamental difference, Bala. Right. I have another question. Um, how does a day of a soldier look like in that in that place? Uh, you know, uh, uh, a soldier there, uh, his primary task, and those are the soldiers, and I'm referring to soldiers who are actually on the line of actual control, the frontline troops. You know, there are troops onto the depth areas, but I'm what I'm speaking is for the frontline troops. So they have uh, the patrolling task uh, for them. Patrolling is that they have to, uh, and patrolling is generally done by about a group of 10 people uh, with an officer. So they go for uh, uh, going up to the line of actual control. They go they go physically up to the line of actual control. And these are, you know, uh, in, in today's news and all you would have heard, these are the patrolling points, PP. So PP14 was where the Galwan incident happened. So these th these are the areas where they regularly patrol. So it could be, uh, you know, uh, twice a week. It could be in some sensitive areas, it could be thrice a week. So these, so it is basically what they go and do is they go, they show their flag there in the sense, not the literal sense, but uh, in the in the in the sense that you know they, they make the presence felt there. Okay, we are here. So the Chinese also sees that okay they have come till there. That is what they claim and that is what they are coming for. So they also come and they also uh, you know uh, come up to their uh, uh, claim whatever they have point. So that is how we control the the our area. So we, when we go there, we look for have the, has the anybody uh, you know encroached upon? Has anybody uh, made anything anything in the vicinity? Even if it is in there, uh, even if it is, let's say, when the Indian troops go, even if uh, within two kilometers of that particular point towards Chinese side also, there's, you're not supposed to make anything. So if they make that also, then also we come back and make a protest. So so this is the, the primary task of the pet, uh, troops who are there is this patrolling. They have to look for uh, such things throughout day in and day out. In fact, in the night patrolling and all do not happen there, unlike in, in, the, uh, in Pakistan scenario. Here it is, a pure, that's why it's a, a proper... Uh, because it, there is no war or there is no war-like situation here. It is more of uh, managing the uh, the line of action. So it, the primary task, of course, is, is patrolling. And uh, during his free time, whatever he has, he he finds time to call up his uh, folks back home. He spends time uh, reading up or listening to music or to watching TV. And those people who are not going for patrolling, they'll catch up with some games, some cricket. But then it's very difficult to play games there because of the altitude problems. So you will catch a lot of, you know, you need uh, things. So, the, but then whatever possible manner, those kind of thing, the, things they do. Uh, how do they stay fit if you can't like play games and all that? Do they exercise? See, and if they yeah. even that's a problem, right? 
yeah yeah definitely it's a problem and uh, uh, this getting fit uh, you know the, we condition our body before we go uh, once uh, before we go for this high altitude our conditioning is started at least 6 to 7 months before that and once you reach there also you have certain uh, standing operating procedures or sops and that involves you know drinking water up to the tune of you know almost uh, 15 glasses of water every day because you you because your blood clots very easily there so you have to drink water so that's itself is a drill for the for the soldiers then uh, you have to yeah. you have to walk a certain amount of uh, 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 for every day you know th- especially for, for those troops who are not involved in this patrolling there will be many who will be you know let's say people who are in the cook houses people who are you know typing letters and all those things so they also have to walk around because if you sit for a very long time you get clots so then uh, so this kind of thing we make make sure and then some light games and all you know little bit of uh, uh, volleyball and those kind of things so that your body is generally but other than that uh we the famous saying what we say is that you know in the land of lama don't try to be a gama there's that you just hold on you know you may be a excellent cross country runner down in the in the in 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 rajasthan but then once you are there don't try to you know just be just just keep quiet and that's how we keep giving the examples of the locals there they walk very slowly with you know almost all the monks of you know they all very very slow and study as if they are not in a hurry anywhere so that is the kind of thing which we should be uh, we keep telling the soldiers also and what's the diet like what do they eat is, is see first of all first and foremost uh, first and foremost is that um, uh, you know your appetite goes for a sixth there you don't feel hungry when you when you are there uh, but then uh, the, uh, the we have some fantastic um, of uh, 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 a food arrangement which is there in the sense that you know the, the it is scientifically made uh, there is a requirement of calories and other such kind of things so those kind of uh, uh, items whether it is Uh, you know cashew nuts or cadbury's and you know, chocolates and fruit juices all those things uh, you know isn't isn't abundance there something like what happens in in the siachen the, the, so scientifically made that this many ca- ca- quantity of uh, nutrients and calories and all those things are are specially sent for troops who are there so that they 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 can uh, take care of their health in all those things so there is no problem of for they have absolutely no issues uh, as far as the food is concerned but definitely the problem is only of appetite because even though you have the food and the best quality food but your body is such that you don't feel like eating much is what is the problem got it got it thanks you know i thought it it was very it is interesting for people to know how the life there is because we i don't think we talk too much about it i must be very challenging uh, but coming to what uh, jagan's question was please go ahead jagan the last casualty in our face of with china was in 1975 what changed on june 14 june 15th number 1 do you think in your opinion was this a deliberate action sanctioned by the top people in the uh, communist party of china cpc uh, which it, this this happened with their blessing um or it was a one off incident how we should view as as an average indian how how we should view this is it a is there been a fundamental tectonic tectonic shift in the uh, relations between us as far as military is concerned or is it do you think this just a flash in the pan what are your thoughts on this uh, so uh, definitely sir this is a very um, pertinent question which is there uh, now we before that we should understand what happened on uh, you know what has been happening from may 5th 6th in the same area you know we know that for since may 5th 6th there is a conflict which is there uh, uh, in this area of pengong so up north hot spring and then towards galwan 14 uh, pp14 at in the galwan valley so these are the three four areas where uh, the conflict has arisen what is the conflict initially there was a uh, you know patrolling clash which took place in pengong so and then the chinese uh, made some uh, movement towards the line of actual control with some additional forces and they placed themselves there that is uh, you know as i mentioned earlier too that you are not supposed to uh, move within 2 km of the line of actual control itself and place yourselves there even if it is temporary it is not it is not permitted per- permissible so you have if you are coming for a patrolling you come for the patrolling up to the lac point and then you go back that is the norm that is the status quo but if you come to even uh, up to the lac point and if you place yourself there with tents you know that is not uh, correct that is the change of status quo which is there and that is what they attempted in doing uh, in in the in three of the areas which was the pp14 uh, pp15 and hot spring area and in the area of dispute the disputed territory or the areas of differing perceptions where the lac itself is two 
there the chinese occupied that disputed territory occupied rather not not occupied placed themselves again with all those tent and they are still there you know between finger 4 and finger 8 so this is what happened now after this there were talks at lieutenant general level talks which actually had never happened before so the, those talks were held and on june 15th the on ground verification and you know, the modalities of those disengagement was being worked out so when that was being worked out uh, the ceo of 16 bihar colonel santosh babu he was there supervising that uh, particular uh, thing with his counterpart that okay this is how we will move out i will move 1.5 kilometers back you will move 1.5 km where is that on ground it is here we will move till this place you will move to this place and there will be no tent or anything in between so in that what is now coming out was that the chinese attempted to uh, you know uh, place one tent there which they you know they were supposed to remove it but they did not do it now was it a local commander's you know smartness or was it a planned thing we are not very sure exactly but it is doesn't look like a, a, a you know we know we have been in military that at the highest level you know the commanders let's say a theater commander will say okay just put one tent there i don't think that kind of thing at that true. level from strategic true, true. level they will not never i mean it's unlikely that they will say so this could be because of this ego clash and all which happens at the local level that somebody or dodge say okay fine we will not remove it now we may remove it tomorrow or maybe day after tomorrow maybe maybe not remove it only you know because we, we are moving with everything else so but you know th- those kind of things we will never know okay we'll say okay, okay we will remove it after 6 hours 10 hours then the problem would have been the no you remove it now you know how can we trust you these kind of things happen on ground and we are not very sure exactly what happened but then the fact of the matter was that there was a clash which took place and 20 of our brave uh, soldiers uh, laid down their lives really and sad. almost 40 uh, uh, chinese also were killed which has been confirmed by various sources including chinese uh, sorry in, uh, the us intel and also a confirmation that they lost uh, soldiers by their official they have told officially that we have also lost how many they have never said how many and they will never say it because we know that even in 1962 yes. the casualties they really really uh, revealed in 1994 so you know after 30 odd years they 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 came out with it so but it is a fact that after 1979 chinese uh, vietnam war this was the first time they have lost soldiers in combat so wow. that's a fact so wow. now uh, uh, now uh, to you said you said this is like a fist fight kind of scenario how do we how do 20 people and 40 people totally 60 people die i mean how does how does i can't even imagine i understand in a gunfight scenario but how do yeah. people die in this case see this is again the uh, uh, the uh, treachery of uh, that particular area if i can put it you know and it's a uh, this area where this happened was the most remotest of all this place number one so uh, for a casualty if somebody even has a um, small casualty if he has to be evacuated through by road he will take at least 7 to 8 hours by road and since this conflict happened in the night there was no way that choppers could have gone and picked them up and they would happened in the night so minimum 8 to 9 hours now 7 to 8 9 hours is easy now second thing was that the terrain itself was such that uh, the, it was on a cliff sort of a thing and there you know this pushing and pushing uh, uh, pulling you could have you can easily fall into the river and those rivers that area is uh, is all stony so if you fall onto that you are gone now even if you don't have any injury but if you fall into the river in the night you will be having hypothermia immediately there is no way because you understand that we are talking of uh, 15000 plus feet wow. at the night when the temperatures are so low so even if you just somebody just pushes him on the in the scuffle and the, somebody just goes and uh, you know just he he's 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 on the he's in the water and even if he comes out then also he is likely to he is not likely to survive because that he is completely wet and the temperatures are such that you know it is very difficult for anybody to survive so the casualties that is why this kind of thing happened there it is you know it's it's unimaginable that without firing a single shot how so much of casualties and this began then you're you're hitting with stones you're hitting with you know all kind of stuff uh, so those kind of things also happened but yet there was no firing and there was no firing from both sides which is a good thing because if firing a, would have happened which if if firing would have happened the yeah. you know the, the scale would have been in hundreds in hundreds both sides and and so it would have changed the dynamics of the uh, relationship fundamentally very true sir very true sir very true it would have reset been, the it would have reset the clock yes, uh, all over yes, again absolutely yeah. sir. yes sir there is no doubt sir at least now uh, you know since there was no firing on both side we still would we like still. to believe that you know it was a 
uh, not a planned kind although there was uh, there is a i know that there is uh, there is a thing that which is say that you know it was a planned action which was done the planning would have been only to the extent that you know we want to teach them a lesson you know those kind of thing not at the you know it was as if uh, somebody planned that you know we will on 15th of june we will wait and you know we will do this no i don't think that was the kind of thing the planning was basically to you know yes give it back you know so that kind of a stuff was definitely there but not in this grand strategy planning those kind of thing may not have happened and i am very sure that uh, whosoever planned this they did not anticipate the outcome of this particular action you know they did not and uh, they did not uh, f- uh, foresee that so many casualties would have ha- happened on the chinese side itself so that is why i further believe that this was not a planned kind of a thing in which uh, there was no firing done but yet they lost uh, uh, people just for one tent i think it is let slightly uh, it was just uh, non adherence to the agreement which was reached but that is definitely there but who decided that only the i think the chinese will be able to tell that who told not to remove that tent those are those are the people who are responsible for it what does it mean for us yeah going forward so, uh, like yeah. as we know now as we speak the the process of disengagement de escalation and de induction the, the although the de induction has not started but we are in the process of disengagement and at least three places there has been you know physical disengagement of troops wherein there is you know there is a gap or a buffer between the troop troops so they are not they are not in any more eyeball to eyeball uh, contact is not there at at pp14 15 and uh, hot spring area so that is one thing and then then coming down south there is that uh, between finger 4 and finger 8 there is some thinning out it will take some time so as i see it in the short term period I, i see that you know there will be a return to status quo ante that's what the indian side wants and that's what i think we will achieve but it will take time and why do i say it will take time is because uh, now this is an exit strategy both nations you know uh, whether knowingly or unknowingly they have got into it which now has a strategic you know kind of a uh, uh, out um, outlook so now to be seen exiting from here honorably is the most you know they both sides would like to look, look with they don't want any loss of face you know if they immediately move up, you know the kind of media coverage which we already have in india so it will become you know it will be seen as a huge loss of face for china and all those things so basically what we are looking at is a gradual de escalation so that it fades away from the media coverage and slow but steadily we return to status quo ante i think just before winters and that is how what is going to happen in the short term period for the long term period this definitely is will be a turning point i have been telling this throughout the india china relations will now be known as pre june 2020 and post june 2020 wow so you know that will be how it will be known as because uh, from here on the relation is not going to be the same again you know and i am not saying that we are going to completely cut off with china no i think in, the, in this in all these things what the silver lining is that india now knows that you know we uh, because the chinese have given them a opportunity to take drastic actions whether it is economic whether it is i think i have just was reading that you know india is going to allow australia to take part in the malabar exercise is what i think uh, is in the latest yes so yes. you know these kind of things is now because we have a reason for it earlier you know we were not feeling that why should we know what will the chinese now we have a firm reason for it and that i think is in the long term will help india to like what we started off the you know the the initial part of our conversation wherein we can achieve our true potential so that is i think is a blessing in disguise what happened here in june 2020 and from here on i think we should not uh, hold anything uh, uh, us back whether it is economic diplomatic militarily uh, and other you know informational also to for us to uh, be seen you know as taking that place uh, in in the global arena which which, which we deserve to be fantastic i think beautifully said i to believe that this will create a a newer it'll it'll really uh, push us to do better achieve uh, more things and we've got a more uh, befitting uh, competition here china is is certainly something that we can learn from in terms of, as an opponent i would prefer a stronger opponent to uh, to set our benchmark in terms of how we perform very beautifully said colonel denny and uh, i think with that what i would like to uh, you know capture is is that um, we know where we've come from we know our past but we know that this is a turning point in our history and this will really uh, it'll, it'll, it it depends on how we how we leverage this and uh, become better in the future thank you very much for joining gentlemen and uh, it was wonderful discussing 
the the reality on the ground wonderful discussing the past and wonderful even kind of you know taking a peek in the future thank you very much thank you it was my pleasure thank bala you, and jagan sir thank you very much nice thank you colonel dinay i know you